everyone, it's Colleen Patrick Gaudreau from JoyfulVegan.com. Welcome to Vegan Point of View. I've heard people say things like self-righteous pig, capitalist pig, fascist pig, liberal pig, fill-in-the-blank pig, stupid pig, fat pig, filthy pig, greedy pig, sloppy pig, make a pig of myself, squeal like a stuck pig, bleed like a stuck pig, male chauvinist pig, road hog, make a silk purse out of a sow's ear, sweat like a pig to pig out the pig police, pigsty, go haul hog, and hog tie. Here's my point of view about pigs. Pigs get a pretty bad rap in our society, aside from the denigrating language we use to talk about them, as I just demonstrated, we also use and exploit them in a variety of ways, as research tools, as food animals. In high school science classes, I remember where pig fetuses are used for dissection, and they, comes, they come straight from the slaughter industry. As entertainment in something called hog baiting or hog dogging, a blood sport whereby a pig or boar is baited and then mauled by a dog for entertainment. As the quarry in hunts that take place for sport, for fun, or to fulfill some kind of personal quest, as in the case of Michael Pollan, who writes about killing a sow in his book, The Omnivore's Dilemma, because, quote, he wanted to see if he could do it. I would argue that in order to continue treating pigs as such, it's first necessary that we shape our perception of them as lowly and dirty and messy, sloppy, insignificant, fat, well, pigs. And yet pigs are actually the cleanest animals of all. My cats are pretty clean. I'm pretty clean. But pigs are incredibly clean. They're incredibly friendly, social, loyal, curious, sensitive, insightful animals. And they've been found to have the intelligence beyond that of an average three-year-old human child. That's what scientists have declared. And beyond that of our beloved domestic dogs. If we think about the stories starring pigs that we read or watched growing up, such as Charlotte's Web or Babe, we would see that these stories are not about pigs living in animal factory conditions. These stories are about people who have a change of heart and fight to keep these pigs alive despite the social and family pressure to do what was intended all along, to kill these animals who were brought into this world just to be killed. Fern, the little girl in Charlotte's Web, is responsible for sparing Wilbur's life, if you remember, in the first chapter of the book. She's begging her father to spare Wilbur. She is described as literally trying to pull the ax out of her father's hands. Her father tells her to control herself. Control myself, yelled Fern. This is a matter of life and death, and you talk about controlling myself? She persuades her father to let her care for Wilbur. In the film Babe, the farmer, played by the wonderful James Cromwell, who's an amazing vegan animal activist, clearly sympathizes with this little pig and likes him immediately as the narrator states, something passed between them, the faintest hint of a common destiny. These stories didn't teach us that animals on factory farms are mistreated, but it's okay to raise and kill animals on small farms. These were small farms. What you come away with is that non-human animals have their own individual personalities and unique contributions to the world. I think the other thing we come away with is that through our interactions with these animals, we have the potential for our own transformations. My ultimate awakening, the moment I became vegan, came when I read the book Slaughterhouse, the shocking story of greed, neglect, and inhumane treatment inside the U.S. meat industry by Gail Eisnitz. In this book, investigative journalist Gail Eisnitz interviews workers at U.S. slaughterhouses, and what I read was so incredibly excruciating but I continued to read because I felt like I owed it to these animals. It may have been painful for me to read, but it wasn't nearly as horrific as what these animals endured day in and day out. And I came to realize that no matter where a pig came from, no matter how an animal was treated, no matter how they were raised, no matter if she was being used for her eggs or milk or flesh, all of these animals were artificially brought into this world only to be killed. And each and every one of them was the victim of egregious 
preventable violence. And all of them fight to live. The other thing I noticed, and I may be wrong here, but there was something about slaughterhouse workers' treatment of pigs that was particularly disturbing. I mean, every species <laughs> like have obscene and perverted acts of cruelty perpetrated against them, but it seemed, it almost seemed that it was consistently egregious against pigs. And I've often wondered if that isn't because the workers recognize the pig's intelligence and sensitivity, which makes them feel even worse about what they're doing and so their response is to lash out even more. It's something I think about a lot. When I first read the workers' depictions in this book, I was physically ill. And even though I was already vegetarian, I compelled myself to bear witness so that I could share their stories with others. Shielding ourselves against painful knowledge doesn't make it go away. So I wanted to share with you just a few excerpts from this book, and I'll let you read them yourself. Just to give you an idea of what we're talking about here, we're talking about over 100 million pigs who are raised and slaughtered in the U.S. every year. So he's not kidding when he says they're killing every second. I often wonder what characteristics non-human animals need in order for us to stop hurting them. Is it intelligence? If so, then we should be just as appalled at the idea of eating dogs or three-year-old humans if intelligence is our, is our measuring stick. Is it playfulness? Is it cleanliness? Is it the ability to create bonds and social systems? Is it the ability to possess maternal instincts? Is it the ability to suffer, to feel pain, to bleed? Pigs possess all of these characteristics in spades. So what will it take? What do animals need to do in order for us to leave them alone? What more could they do? Or is it up to them at all? Perhaps not. Perhaps it's up to us. In order to change our treatment of them, we need to change our perceptions of them. We need to change our notions of what we need to eat in order to survive and thrive. And pigs needn't be on that list. If we can't imagine these things that you just read being done to the animals with whom we share our lives, the familiar animals, the cats, the dogs, the rabbits, the horses, then we need to ask ourselves, what's the difference? To the animals, to the pigs, it's all the same. Thanks for watching, everybody. I know it's hard. I really commend all of you who made it through this video and who made it through reading those excerpts. I do recommend that you read Slaughterhouse. It was life-changing for me, as painful as it was. Please give this video a thumbs up and please share your comments below. Please tell me stories of pigs that you've met. Um, I've met some pretty amazing pigs in my time and I'd love to hear about your stories. I've met amazing pigs, of course, at animal sanctuaries, which we're so blessed to have. Please check out other vegan point of view videos. Check out my vegan uh, food for thought podcast at itunes or wherever you listen to your podcast and of course go to joyfulvegan.com for all of my books more information about this just really everything um, everything you can imagine about uh, about living compassionately and healthfully and please support the making of these videos for the animals for the pigs this is colleen patrick Gaudreau. thanks for watching